Jesse Gray, welcome to Books. We have a two-part program this evening with two guests, Richard Bergen and David Shapiro. Welcome, both of you. Uh, we'll be talking first about a new magazine. This is the second issue of the New York Arts Journal. It's on the newsstands now. Richard Bergen is the editor. David Shapiro is a very well-known poet and contributing editor. And the second half of books will be a poetry reading by David Shapiro, which is a special treat. Richard Bergen will introduce David Shapiro later more at length. Richard himself, you are the author of two books, aren't you? Conversations with Borges, Luis Borges, which was translated into five languages, and a work of fiction, The Man with Missing Parts. And David Shapiro is the author of five books, and we'll go more into them later. Let's begin with the New York Arts Journal. It's the second issue is just out. What's in it, Richard, David? <laughs> well, um, what's in it is the, an attempt to continue the uh, basic premise of the magazine, which I tried to state uh, in the editorial of the first issue. In other words, it's an attempt to deal with the interaction of as many major art forms as possible while trying to achieve an equal balance between critical reflection and worthwhile creative achievement. All the arts. And well, that's impossible. And it really. has creative new work. We have fiction, poetry, photography. We have book reviews, art reviews. Eventually as well we'll, as reviews. Eventually we'll have film and theater reviews and record reviews beginning next issue, I might add. Uh, in our first issue, we had Douglas Davis writing on art politics. We had poetry by David Shapiro, John Updike, Robert Bly. We had interviews with Rob Gray and John Cage. In this issue... In this issue? What's uh, in this issue? We have an interview with Edward Albee. Uh, what, what, does, what specifically? Just let's stop there. Sure. Albee, what, what does You're he reveal in this interview? is. <laughs> no, I'm not. What does he say in, in this interview? What would, might people be interested in? Yes, in meditations. Actually, I, I first met Edward at a New York City at the Wagner Writers Conference. When he was finishing Virginia Woolf, I, I remembered him talking about this, a new play which had a lot of Latin in it. At, at any rate, this, this interview has, uh, had some very useful meditations, I thought. Um, I hadn't seen it before it just came out on um, the kinds of mistakes that will often occur in productions of Virginia Woolf. It's very useful. Um, does he in ways, talk about his ferocious and intimate interview with I think it's David. I'm sorry, David. Yeah, sorry. I think it's Jermaine especially uh, to, to have an interview with him at this time. Uh, and this was the occasion, actually, for the interview because Virginia Woolf was brought right, back. Right, exactly. And he talks about the specific production of it. And he also gets into some It's the first time he directed it, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and there are some useful remarks on politics. It's interesting to find out that Edward does vote. Because <laughs> 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 we're not young. <laughs> In other words, we will find some personal anecdotes about him that we might not. Yeah, it, 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 and, and yes, and it's, a, it's an insight, uh, certainly into one of uh, our leading playwrights. I think that's incontestable by now. And this is a very useful review. Mm -hmm. Something that I love, my favorite artist is, is Jasper Johns, in, in many ways. And Jasper has just been working on a very beautiful book a collaboration in and of itself. So it's useful in a magazine that emphasizes the collaborative aspects of art that Samuel Beckett and Jasper have, have just produced one of the most beautiful books, I think, in the last 10 years. And there's a, it, it's a book that will be seen shortly. And there's a very beautiful um, sense in which the, the painter and the poet have come together to do this. Um, yeah, so there, there's a preview of this new book in the right. New York Arts Journal. Yeah. You have Lucas Foss, the conductor of the Brooklyn Philharmonia. Yeah, it was difficult. Uh, I had interviews with uh, Aaron Copeland by the same people who did this uh, interview with Foss. They're uh, writing Charles a book composers, aren't yes, they? Yes, and uh, Lucas. And I, uh, I selected the Foss because uh, I felt he had the most interesting things to say overall. Uh, despite the fact well, that Copeland's Well, now, aren't you going to be using Mr. Composer. Copeland in the future? Well, um, Hopefully, you know, um, we might want to break away from the strict format in terms of a 
portion that we devote to so-called classical yeah. or European music to, uh, from interviews and maybe get some articles. Uh, we'll see. I'm not entirely convinced at this point that we'll always be doing interviews with composers. You know, the way the Paris View, for example, always had interviews with writers. Do you all were a magazine of, of, of more than one art. And Do you find the magazine assuming a direction of its own that perhaps you hadn't originally, if only in expanding? Well, let me, uh, let me answer that by this question, uh, this question by, by, with this response. Um, Cocteau made a remark, uh, which I always thought of, and I don't mean it to apply certainly to myself uh, or to the magazine, uh, in its originally intended sense, but I think in a modified sense, it, uh, it's of some value. He's uh, a very good definition. He said, a genius is someone who sees a target no one else does, a target no one else does, and hits it. Now, let's say, for this purpose, uh, something that's original, an original, whether it be a magazine, a book, a person, <laughs> uh, sees a target no one else does and hits it. I, would, I believe uh, that this magazine sees the target, envisions the target, and is about 70% towards hitting it, 65 to 70%. Do you want to speak I'm polemically about those <laughs> magazines and those formats that you don't, that are not hitting the target? Oh, well, I think they, well, I think they abound. I mean, uh, I uh, didn't want to They do don't hit your target. Well, of course. A lot of magazines are imitations of each other, and I, I have no desire to criticize existing publications because people, a little magazines, let's say, everybody has some money, you know, money problems, and it's a constant uh, struggle for things to survive economically. Uh, you know, I, I have no desire to do that. Um, suffice to say that uh, if a magazine has a formula, uh, other magazines will copy it. Every time has its Newsweek, every Playboy has its Penthouse, <laughs> and, 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 and it, uh, it's the same principle is operative uh, in magazines of the and arts. And you've tried not to copy anyone? Well, I don't think there is a serious, at the same time, lively magazine of the arts that has, as I said, a balance between creative and critical work. It's dazzling to me to see how few really essentially interdisciplinary magazines there are. I remember a few years ago I was considering, for example, um, the situation of the arts and sciences. There's not really a serious journal in, in the country that deals with the interrelationships between the arts and the sciences. Um, in terms of, I think, most artists today, for example, long for Gesamtkunstwerk, for, for a work of art that partakes of all the different art forms. One thinks of the new opera by Robert Wilson, which has beautiful music by Philip Glass. And, There'll probably be an aesthetic meditation on that soon, I hope, in this magazine. But, and in magazines themselves tend very often to dwindle into specialist possibilities. And certainly, no dwindle is the word. Or deliquesce, melt away <laughs> like the tops of so many trees. But I mean, as a specialist, as a scholar, I certainly in no way would cry out against specialist magazines. They're needed and useful. Everyone wants to know from the John Keats Quarterly what Keats was doing in September 1818. But it's very useful <laughs> in a city like New York to have a magazine that's involved in something a little more synthetic yeah. than analytic in that. What's it like, Richard, to come to New York and launch a new magazine? How do you do it? Well, it's, um, it's, been, uh, it's been very difficult and time consuming and... Um, Where do you begin? You come to New York, you rent an apartment, and then? I depend on the kindness of strangers, as a famous heroine once said. <laughs> I, in a sense, I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. Uh, Did you know people when you came to New York? Uh, a few. Uh, I think there should be a photograph of Richard's apartment, which often has nothing but the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, I, I think there could be a very moving photograph of this. <laughs> people, well, now, you live in the same apartment building. Why don't we assign you official photographer? I don't have those bags. Uh, you're a <laughs> no, it would be a very moving David one of the people who helped me. I might add that this magazine originated uh, in Boston. I felt New York was a more appropriate forum for it, and David helped me out then. Did you, you did know several people when you came to New York. Yeah, and I've, I've met, uh, you know, New York, of course, has this stereotype image of hustlers, name droppers, ruthlessly aggressive people, and a lot of that's true. <laughs> but there are also some magnificent human beings when you dig for them, and I've met them. Did people lead you and to people? Is well, that yes, mainly yes, how sure. you've met? Sure. Then how do you go about gathering material? Did you come with material? Did I've, you have well, a certain amount? Yeah, or? people have asked me, uh, a number of people have asked me, how are you, if you, 
you know, first of all, my staff, although it's not a non-profit magazine, but that could lead us into a, a long discussion, it's which we've done in time legally not, not, no, not no, non-profit, I have investors, although in fact is, and, 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 at and, this and, moment. And, well, no, what I'm, what I'm saying is that... Um, You're not a charity, Richard, are you? We're not a charity with, with sole stock. We, we, we uh, you know, get ads and so forth that people pay for. But we pay our contributors, you know, a very little amount of money. And people ask me, how are you able to get, you know, such great people? And I think, uh, for example, uh, Douglas Davis, um, how are we able to get a 28-page essay from him, uh, which is a chapter from his new book? Most of and the art, who is the art critic of, of Newsweek, Newsweek and was in the We're, first issue. Yeah. And the reason is, that's just a case in point. I mean, I could name 10 others that comes to mind. Most magazines are like bars of soap. They're homogenous. They have a tone of voice that a writer uh, is even uh, constricted in uh, terms of his actual, what he actually produces, to try to fit the needs, both in length of words, tone of voice, and general aim. They're writing for an editor. People say, how many words do you want? I don't touch anybody's fiction or poetry. I try to make this a writer's magazine. Therefore, I think that people will write for this because they know they can get to say what they want to say in a serious form and that uh, uh, serious people will read, will read it. And, and yeah. so, excuse me, Jesse. <laughs> and so, uh, of course, everybody is interested in money and uh, that I can't offer. <laughs> There's still something in human beings they know they're going to leave the planet. They don't know what will happen to them after that. There's something in human beings, no matter how concerned they are with money, they want to have a chance uh, to speak their mind. Freely. And uh, without uh, the kind of uh, censorship imposed by big, slick magazines, or even by some little magazines that say, look, you have these many words. This is what has to be said. It's going to be in this tone, and that's it. Uh, this is a heterogeneous magazine. It's not a bar of soap. There are many different writers. There are many different aesthetics operative in the reviews and uh, in the creative material. It's, it's, hard, it's hard. It's what you're aiming for, too. Yeah. This well, is your purpose. It, in, the, in the editorial, in, in the first issue, I said there's only one school. I quoted Nabokov, the school of talent, and I believe that. You know, So you, we have our, uh, avant-garde photographers and avant-garde fiction writers. We have more traditional fiction writers or poets. Um, these are just words. When you live in relation to, uh, let's say, uh, a time beyond the, the brief time you're given to live of, uh, uh, on this planet, those terms are meaningless. Uh, it's a quality of something that makes something endure. And, P and I realize, understand that. And, uh, it is uh, horrifying to learn how many magazines do have dictatorial ways in which they're, you know, one associates this with uh, loose mechanisms, but not necessarily with some of our better literary magazines, but actually sub rows of behind the scene. There, there's a tremendous amount of editorializing in which editors function as arbiters of taste and are often mutilating or, or changing work. So actually, the, the idea of accepting, accepting you know, in a non-revisionary sense, yeah, a, a, some sense of, of pluralism, which can look, on the one hand, like a sloppy Catholicism, on the other hand, has some of the advantages of a real eclecticism. And, I think, and, uh, and in this I case, it is, sounds very unique, uh, from what you're saying. To put it together, how, how long does it take? We, what's involved? Do you have to sell ads? A tremendous just amount of uh, cooperation uh, and help how, from how other people. Uh, I consider my designer a secular saint. He gets a, he's highly, uh, he's I highly consider paid. him one too. He's highly paid by a publication I shan't name. Uh, as a designer, and uh, he designed this uh, for free, and uh, doing thousands of dollars worth of work because he loves a chance to express himself. Now you teach okay. at Columbia. You're you're working on a book, I understand, with Isaac Bashevi Singer. That's one of the two books I'm working. I'm also working on a novel. Yeah. How much sleep do you get a night? <laughs> Very little. <laughs> but <laughs> when we have when we have. Uh, a David Shapiro on the well, the, important, so not get into my trouble. The, important thing is, the important thing is to dream intensely during the short hours of sleep that one, one has. I found during a period of, of life in which I was not um, sleeping too much that I could get most of my poems from dreams. You know, one simply decided what to get from dreams. This might be a good time to turn <laughs> to your poetry. Which a dreamy modulation is about, to, is about to take place. David Shapiro was going to uh, give us, and it was, I mean, is going to give us a poetry reading. David, uh, Richard, would you like to introduce his work more at length? Well, I can uh, simply say before I mention the books uh, themselves again, uh, 
that I, I think David is both the ideal, you know, what's often said by writers, it's, it's really a cliche. Uh, they talk about, oh, well, I have an ideal writer I write for. I write for my wife, and she's my best critic, or it's a woman. I write for my husband, perhaps, uh, uh, or I write for a few friends. I think Robert Lowell was quoted as saying. Uh, I think David Shapiro, uh, in, a, in a very real sense, is both the ideal writer and reader for this kind of magazine, precisely because here is a man who is an excellent uh, uh, professional violinist, an art critic, and the author of five books of poetry, one of which was uh, uh, nominated for National Book Award, a man holding an acoustic panel. Um, a person who's been seriously and with great integrity uh, involved in more than one art form. So he's both sympathetic to the different arts and also cognizant with contemporary developments. And as this magazine is not attempting to be a museum of the past, uh, a scholarly publication, uh, or something that might emanate from a university, but something that's dealing with the present, again, David's ideal, uh, and I'm uh, honored to have him uh, helping me in this project uh, because he's so con uh, conversant, conversant with uh, contemporary developments in all the arts and with their interrelationship. Uh, so let's hear David read. <laughs> I'll accept that eulogy. <laughs> um, I thought I'd read from um, a few of my books, but I want to begin with um, a poem, which will be the title poem of my next book, entitled Lateness. Um, it's an elegy from my mother. I'd also um, like to de dedicate it to the Chilean ambassador um, who was ruthlessly murdered um, yesterday, Orlando Letiere. Um, lateness. The nerves are foolish. Invisibility induces offers. Tears streaming like bigots in a zephyr are mildly antiseptic due to salt content. Tears secret and stainless, precursors for the sound of your voice. People burst open and are released and release themselves, easily picked up in that wind, at the lower and rounded end of the heart. No man ever saw those forests of fern, but I see you in your bed as you floundered in a stream of air and light. Blue and brown and black and hazel, the eye divested of tears like insignias with a blow. The lacrimal apparatus remains in the bright room. We are separate now and move rapidly like tears. The legs from the knees are missing, and the arms are joined awkwardly to the body. A lion tears your hair fallen low at the back. The whole world would have been the pediment. The lion's mane has successive rows of flames. In your missing hand, you would have held the lion. My face, the epigram, is carved in large red letters above our holes, feet of the deceased, and traces are preserved of the wise and excellent doctor Aeneas. Doubt is represented in traces of blue wine with nine carved petals. Leaves are falling in schematic folds. The tongue of a conquered hero protrudes slightly. The face is long with a battered surface. Inscriptions we engraved on our thighs. A leaf falls from your lips, and I am in love with my lot. Only the upper world is intoxicated. Color would have covered you. The scene itself comes from some original. The child extends his hand in an eager manner toward his mother, in his hand a puppet doll of the deceased. In the hole in her right breast would be wedged the spear of the victorious warrior. Only your head is preserved. It turns back in agony, thus drowns back into the depth of the shrine. It is the work of a good sculptor. It is difficult to distinguish between the living and the dead. The deceased plays the piano in the airy plains of the ocean, a rich throne which shows the need to heroize this woman unjustly dead. Eros touches her lightly with the palm of his left hand. The little refugee can scarcely stand on his feet a young woman is leaning on her arm, which, stretched vertically, closes the composition. This poem, it's interesting, I mean, and I, I didn't select this poem for this purpose, but actually, this poem was inspired very much by um, the funeral stele in Greece, um, an example of the fact that poetry is not um, necessarily to, to imitate the world, though it's certainly often inspired by, by other arts. Um, this was inspired by some of the very domestic and in certain ways very sentimental family groupings that one finds in, in um, in Greek art. It was also inspired by something of the dead language of art criticism. Um, I became very inspired by certain stupid tones of prose, such as 
the questions in physics textbooks and um, sometimes one flees in times of pain towards something very neutral like the dictionary and art criticism sometimes offers something of this in incredible world of, of flatness and so the archaeological museum of Athens has a very beautiful catalog and I was inspired by th those descriptions um, I think like the poet John Ashbery who's also inspired by something of of the taste for, for prose. That poem is inspired by that. I'll read some other poems. Um, and th since, in, in, the, in this issue, there, there are some works by Jasper Johns. Um, one of my poems, called A Man Holding an Acoustic Panel, w um, was inspired by taking tours of the science museums in Europe. But it was also inspired by the fact that when I lived in Cambridge University from 68 to 70, um, a friend of Jasper Johns, Mark Lancaster, had a beautiful um, sculpture by Jasper of a light bulb, this gray light bulb. Um, was one, one of the most inspiring things in England at the time. And um, I became very moved by that sculpture, and I wanted to write a poem that would, at, in some sense, be an analog to what is sort of horribly um, opaque and threatened about Jasper's um, works of art. Jasper likes, as he says, to throw doubt on everything. So I wanted to create works of art that would, in, in that sense, also throw doubt. It's hard, it's hard to, to do that in a poem, but I'll read I'll read three parts from this long poem called um, A Man Holding a Pussy Pan. David, I hope that you, you end with my favorite poem from the page turner. I will. <laughs> which will show why you are. I'm always willing in to. In fact, um, uh, in all likelihood, the leading poet of your generation. <laughs> all right. Um, at any rate, when I was in, Very I participated in the Columbia Riots in 1968. This poem ends with, um, a, and I also read it in, in relationship to Orlando Lettiere. Um, it ends with um, the funeral of Jan Palach, who is torch number one in Czechoslovakia. He killed himself, um, and his funeral, horribly enough, became a demonstration. I I'm just making a selection from this long poem, because it's impossible. A child comes home and tells his mother the teacher will give him some marks, but it is not true. The teacher will give him no marks at all, either good or bad. And we know nothing except that on the face of it, 150,000 years ago, an Englishman said doodle doo, and a French girl said coco rico. But as with Frederick the Great and Machiavelli, there was not the same financial power at their disposal. The Americans became American all over. The cricket was fertile, mostly during the years of paradox when it was rare and alone. The bee could not distinguish, but it could prefer. Her body soaked in the flower was impregnated with it. You agree. So the museum director helps you with the apparition of pululation, a device enabling you to hear a fable of La Fontaine said in most languages. This is Le Corboy Le Renard in Yugoslavian the language of your choice, and you thought it was broken. The electric fish have made the plunge. All is quiet now except the breathing torpedoes. Now it is a quarter past three. No, it is not quarter past three, it is quarter to three. It's hard for a leopard to have a hypochondriac for a friend. Now it's half past five. I'm just, this is the funeral of Jan Palach. When I entered the first meditation, I escaped the gravity of the object I experienced the emptiness, and I have been dead a long time. When I had a voice you could call a voice, my mother wept to me, my son, my beloved son, I never thought this possible. I'll follow you on foot. Halfway in mud and slush, the microphones picked up. It was raining on the houses. It was snowing on the police cars. The astronauts were weeping, going neither up nor out. And my own mother was brave enough, she looked, and it was all right, I was dead. I think, um, I don't want to read too much of that. I'll get too depressed on TV. <laughs> However, this poem, was inspired, <laughs> this poem was inspired by, by the stupidities of, of another kind of prose, Berlitz prose. It's called The Carburetor at Venice. I wrote it first in Italian. Um, I, I did also draw a very bad picture for this particular poem. It's, it's easier to rhyme in Italian. And, um, but I was very moved by the Berlitz textbooks, and I guess everyone has been since Inesco and Pirandello were, were moved by it. It's just um, a, a little poem that is involved with learning a language. The carburetor at Venice. I won't read the Italian. <laughs> I've had an accident I cannot see. I've broken my glasses and I've missed my train. I like you very much. Do you like me? I need a guide. I need a secretary. For when? For tomorrow. I will come again. I've had an accident I cannot see. I need an interpreter. Here's my key. Ouch! Stop! How long will it take? Please use Novocaine. I like you very much. Do you like me? Remove your clothes, open your mouth, and lie like an interesting city under an airplane. I've had an accident, I cannot see. My battery is dead, charge up the battery. Can you draw me a little map of the road I'm on? I like you very much, do you like me? Can I see you today for the whole day? How long will that be? Here is a present for you. 
a silver brain. I have had an accident. I cannot see. I like you very much. Do you like me? You can see that coming from a while before. I think I have time to read maybe the one. Yes, do Richard, read Richard's Richard favorite. Right. We have three. <laughs> this film was used as an advertisement for a physics textbook. Um, I was glad that the man had not sued me for, for plagiarizing his book, presumably just like the advertisement. It's called The Page Turner. It's all mathematically correct. <laughs> the cover of the book is itself exactly. Page one is you within a small room. Page three already a fair field for your tomb. Page four contains Newark matter-of-factly. Page five appropriates all its frightening streets. On page six, Greater Manhattan glumly fits. There is room on page seven for all deceits. And on page eight, the earth comfortably sits. And now the pages get much more inspiring. We turn again and not much can be seen. Though on page 10, the moon begins soaring into details. Darkness comes in on page 11. On page 12, we see bodies not unlike our body. Let's leave them at this stage. Now we can see the sun, the first star for our sake that moved us from the center of our page. Like us, the asteroids are always traveling and other rocky lumps that never waver. And now miles are an inconvenient thing. The traveler ages less than the observer. That solar system is withered to a dot, and we've been turning pages for light years. By 22, your naked eye is shot by all the naked stars when night was yours. Naked-eyed page turners around the world turn very rapidly to page 23. Two dinner plates is our galaxy, vague whiteness in which the main course is still veiled. On page 27, we approach the limit, and we are neither unique nor rare. No matter how far we go into it, at the end of our amazement is distant air. Now we really seem to be near the end, covering one more page at enormous speeds. And what can we expect from our imaginary hand on page 28, when all we see recedes? Thank you very much, David Shapiro. Thank you. Where can we find That's your books? Edge and let's, let's name your books. It's probably easier <laughs> to find the New York Arts Journal than my book. <laughs> But you know, the page turner was my last book. And my next book, which will come out from Overlook at Viking Effect, um, will be out I think, in the summer, really. But my books can often be found in varieties of good bookstores, like the Gotham Bookmart in New York. And good bookstores often get burnt down in New York <laughs> too fast to find my books. But they do exist, and I'm sure if I had Richard distributing them, they'd <laughs> even be found more quickly. Well. And, I, and you're going to be featured very much so in the next I, issue I, I of the New York so. Arts I'm, Journal. I'm, I'm counting on some major work from David. Uh, Even minor work. <laughs> Even minor work. <laughs> so thank you very much for watching. And thank you for coming. David Shapiro, poet, Richard Bergen, editor of the New York Arts Journal. I'm Jesse Gray.